This is a story of a wife and mother that no one could imagine existed, but unfortunately she did. Was it a case of mental illness undiagnosed or just plain evil that wreaked havoc in the McGrath household and only the children would live to tell the tale? A mother whose daughter would write a book giving details of what it was like growing up with her mother Vera, a domineering, abusive and cruel woman that would stop at nothing to make the people around her miserable especially her husband Brian and daughter Veronica. Bernard Brian McGrath, you could safely say, had a hard life from the beginning. Brian was born in 1944 and soon after his birth he was wrapped in a blanket and left on the steps of a church in Castle Blaney in County Monaghan. He was then taken in and raised by the local nuns. When he was a teenager he was brought to the infamous Artane Industrial School in Dublin. This industrial school was established in 1871 by the Christian Brothers and closed in 1969. I'm not going into the abuse the children suffered in this industrial school, as to be honest I don't have the stomach for it. I think their story is so important and I will leave links in the description box if anyone would like to read up on it. And maybe at some stage I will do a video on the abuse these poor children suffered under the Catholic Church regime. Brian stayed in Artane Industrial School until he turned 16, where he was released wearing the clothes he stood up in and a brand new pair of boots. He had no family, no support system and was left to fend for himself. Shortly afterwards, he would meet 12-year-old Vera Langan on Velvet Strand in Port Marnock in Dublin. They struck up a friendship and kept in contact over the next few years. While Brian joined and served in the British Army, they would write to each other often. When Brian left the army, he returned to Ireland and he and Vera started seeing each other romantically. When Vera turned 18, the two hopped on a ferry and went to the UK and got married. It was now 1967. Vera's family were not happy as they saw Brian as a nobody because of his history and not having a stable background or family. Brian and Vera decided to stay in London and work there for many years. In 1968, they had their first child, Veronica, and two years later, they returned to Ireland. At first, Vera's family took them in and they lived in Finglas in Dublin. But soon the McGraths got a small house in North Strand, a residential inner city neighbourhood on the north side of Dublin. In 1975, Brian and Vera would welcome their second child, a boy named Brian Jr. And after that, another boy, Andrew. To the outside, the family seemed fine. Vera's family doted on the children and there would be plenty of family days out to the beach and family celebrations which the McGraths would attend. But behind closed doors, Vera was becoming unhinged and everyone walked on eggshells, especially Brian and Veronica. Nothing Veronica did was good enough. Everything and anything would send Vera into a rage. For some reason, the boys could do no wrong but everything Veronica did was ridiculed. Veronica would be left to do everything, including looking after the boys, while her mother went to bed for days with depression. Eventually, the family moved to East Wall in Dublin to a slightly bigger house, but things did not improve for Veronica. While Vera worked in a local hotel, Brian worked different jobs around the city. When the third boy was born, Edward, the family was complete. Brian decided that he wanted to move the family out to the countryside. It was something he always wanted. He bought a house near Cool in County Westmeath. He spent his weekends doing it up so the family could move in eventually. Finally, when they did move in, it did not change Vera's black moods and her taking to the bed. While Vera did this, poor Veronica was left to look after the boys. Veronica at this stage was in a place where all she wanted to do was please her mother and do her best for the boys, but as you can probably imagine, it went unappreciated. But not only that, Veronica became a punching bag, not only emotionally, but physically at the hands of Vera. She'd have Veronica stand in a corner and repeat quotes, I am fat or I am stupid. She would also humiliate and degrade Veronica in front of her friends. Poor Veronica also suffered from dyslexia, which would go undiagnosed, as at the time it wouldn't have been a thing. Also, Veronica would have missed a lot of school because of having to take care of her brothers, so she never got the education she needed. 
Veronica left school at 15 and this was another thing her mother would use against her. Brian also suffered his wife's wrath. They constantly fought each other and at times it became physical between the two. Vera would often pack up herself and the children after one of these rows. She and the children would stay in hostels and refuges but soon return home and the whole cycle would start again. This made things very unstable for the children. One time she even left the family home with the children and moved to the UK, staying in a family shelter and putting them into school. Vera met a man while there and they started seeing each other. She moved back to Ireland and left the children in the UK at the shelter with some money. Three weeks later she returned with Brian to collect the children and they stayed living there for a while but returned to Ireland and to the family home in Cool. When the family returned, they soon fell back into their old ways. Vera decided, though, that she did not want Brian there anymore and wanted him out of the way. She went to see a doctor in the next village and spoke to him about Brian and having him committed to a mental institution. She told the doctor that Brian was abusive, uncontrollable and mentally ill. Vera succeeded in having poor Brian committed to St. Loman's Psychiatric Hospital in Mullingar, where he stayed for a week, until two of his employers intervened and successfully got him out of there. This would have been very traumatic for Brian, having been institutionalised already from the time he was left on the steps of the church to the age of 16, and the suffering he had gone through at Artane's Industrial School. Vera was not a happy bunny when Brian was released, as she was of the understanding that only she could decide when Brian could leave. Back then, it was the next best thing if you didn't want to murder someone. You just had them committed instead. This happened to Manny back in the day. When Brian got out, he was a broken man. He was quiet and did not engage in fighting with Vera anymore. He was only a shell of the man he once was. I'm sure when he was locked up for that week, many demons came back to haunt him. In 1984, Vera once again packed up the children and moved to the UK. This time she started divorce proceedings. Even though divorce was not legal at this time in Ireland, it was in England. And as they had gotten married over there, they could get a divorce. But Brian arrived over to England and again they decided to make a go of it. And so Vera withdrew her petition to divorce Brian. At this stage, Veronica had had enough and decided she needed to get away from the family. She got a job as a live-in housekeeper in Liverpool. She only had to do light housework and take the children to and from school. Unfortunately, this job did not work out, but rather than returning home to the chaos of her family, she got a job in a fast food place and got her own little flat nearby. It would be through her job that she would meet Colin Pinder. He was very handsome, tall half English and half Jamaican, and five years older than Veronica. They struck up a friendship and he encouraged her to start working out. He showed her how to dress and built up her self-esteem. He managed to undo some of the damage Veronica's mother had instilled into her all her life. Veronica finally saw who she really was with the help of Colin. Eventually, the two would begin dating and would end up living together. But like anything, nothing good lasts forever especially when Vera was around. She soon tracked down where Veronica and Colin were living. When she arrived at their flat, they pretended not to be home, but the second time she called, they knew they couldn't ignore her. Colin answered the door while Veronica hid in the bathroom. Eventually, when Veronica decided to make an appearance in the room where Vera and Colin were sitting, Vera launched herself towards her and gave her a big hug, as if they were a happy mother and daughter delighted to see each other again. Of course, this was all a show for Colin. Vera wanted Veronica to move back to Ireland and although Veronica was resistant at first, her and Colin decided to go back and try it for a while. When they arrived back in Ireland in 1987, the cottage they were to rent fell through and so a caravan was bought and moved on to the land at Cool. This is where the young couple would live bringing Veronica full circle back into the situation she had left, looking after her brothers and at the mercy of her mother's moods. Vera, on the other hand, was delighted to have them there. Vera loved to show Colin off. To her, he was young, handsome and exotic, and she liked the attention it brought her by the locals. 
Veronica was only 18 when Colin asked her to marry him, even though at this stage they had only been together three months. Veronica was miserable living in the caravan beside her parents' house. There was constant fighting, throwing of things and arguments, but the young couple continued to live there. Vera was also involved in the church and got quite close to a certain priest. But this priest was not any old priest. It was Father Brendan Smith. He was a Catholic priest from Belfast in Northern Ireland who had become notorious as a child molester, using his position in the Catholic Church to obtain access to his victims during a period of over 40 years. He sexually abused and indecently assaulted at least 143 children in parishes in Belfast, Dublin and the United States. His actions were frequently hidden from the police and the public by Roman Catholic officials. Vera engaged Smith in their family problems and marital issues. She had invited him to the house in Cool, and this is when Smith advised Brian and Vera that they should spend some time away together, just the two of them, no children. That they need not worry about the three boys. He'd stay in the house and mind them, and Veronica would help them too. Vera, of course, loved the idea of a holiday away from Cool and the children. Brian, on the other hand, did not and refused the offer. There was no way he'd leave his boys at the hands of the Catholic Church. It was obvious Brian knew from experience what could happen to his children, and so by refusing to leave them, he saved them from the horror that could have been at the hands of Smith. It would be only a few years later when all the scandals of the Catholic Church, including Smith, would come to light. Vera was furious with Brian when he refused to leave the boys with Smith and a massive row ensued. Veronica, at this stage, finally looked to live elsewhere and she asked a neighbour if they could move their caravan onto his land, away from the home place. Things got a bit easier for the young couple once they moved, but Vera was not far away. Poor Brian, after the incident with Smith, was at an all-time low. He was mortified meeting the locals after his stay in the psychiatric hospital and couldn't bear meeting people, but he had no peace at home either and he spent most of his time in his bedroom. He felt defeated and Veronica could see this in him, and he told her he wanted to leave, but she begged him to stay for the sake of the boys. In March 1987, Vera and Brian visited Veronica and Colin in their caravan. Brian went to visit his friend, and Vera stayed with the young couple. What would happen next would have many layers and many truths and lies by the people who witnessed and took part in the murder. Veronica recalled that on the night in question, her mother Vera was filled with a strange energy. She joked with Colin that she wanted to get rid of Brian and teased him saying he wouldn't be up to a task like that. Colin had pulled out a large wrench from a toolbox and told her this would do the trick. As the night drew to a close, the three of them walked up to the neighbour's house where Brian was visiting and they all drank tea together. After a while, the four walked back to the home place. When they arrived back, the attack began. Veronica said that Colin had pulled the wrench from his sleeve and hit Brian over the head with it. Veronica fled at that point. Then Vera grabbed a lump hammer and hit Brian over the head also. Brian grabbed a ladder to put distance between his attackers and himself. Then Veronica came back crying and in shock knowing what was going on. Vera ordered her inside the house to turn on the radio so the boys inside sleeping would not hear the cries for help from their father. Brian tried to get away and ran up the driveway towards the road and hid in the overgrown ditch. Colin picked up a slash hook and was swiping at the bushes, with Vera following close behind. Veronica at this stage ran to her father as he begged for his life, saying that if they let him go that he would leave and never return, that Vera could have everything including the house. Brian made a run for it and collapsed at the gate. Colin picked up and dragged him to the back of the house and hit him over the head with a concrete pillar. Finally, Brian succumbed to his injuries and died. Colin and Vera decided that it was best to bury Brian on the property while Veronica hid in the house in shock at what had just happened. Colin and Vera dug a shallow grave of around 18 inches deep in the back end of the site that the house stood on. When they had buried Brian, it was time to clean up around the yard. There was blood everywhere. 
The outside walls were covered in Brian's blood and Vera made Veronica clean her father's blood off these walls. Where the blood couldn't be removed, no matter how hard they scrubbed, Vera came up with the bright idea of pouring tar over these areas. Vera and Colin would give different accounts of what happened that night. Not only did they differ from each other, but also differ to Veronica's version of events. Vera had told the Guardi that Brian had been volatile and abusive, that they had argued on the way to visit Veronica and Colin that night, and when she told her daughter and soon-to-be son-in-law of how Brian was with her and how they had argued on the way to them. Colin said he would take care of Brian once and for all and pull the wrench out of the toolbox. The three continued talking into the night about how they could finally get rid of Brian and a plan was hatched. Vera said when all four of them arrived back to the house and as she unlocked the front door, she saw Colin slip the wrench out from his sleeve. She motioned Colin to stop but Colin didn't adhere and he attacked Brian with the wrench by striking him over the head. Vera would admit hitting Brian also. She said she only hit her husband once, but only because Colin had told her to. Colin told Gardy that Brian had been verbally abusive towards him and used racial slurs. The day of the killing, he arrived home drunk and the two men got into an argument. He said Brian had used racial slurs towards him and called him the N-word. Brian had attacked him in the kitchen and with Colin defending himself, Brian had fallen and hit his head on the range cooker in the kitchen. He said the three of them then decided to bury Colin on the property. And then life seemed to carry on as normal. Vera told her friends and neighbours that Brian had gone to the Netherlands for work. Then she went to a solicitor and had a barring order taken out against him. She told anyone that would listen to her that she had suffered years of abuse and now Brian had deserted the family. After this, she applied for deserted wives' benefit and was granted it. A month later, in April in 1987, Veronica and Colin were married. Vera was again on the move and she and the three boys moved to England once more. While in England, Veronica and Colin moved into the family home at Cool. They kept in contact with Vera and at one stage Vera became concerned with Brian's body buried in the field. Vera returned from the UK with the three boys in order to deal with the situation. She was worried that a neighbour might discover the body. Colin and herself dug up Brian and built up a prior and placed Brian's body on top of it and set it alight. They fed the fire with wood and fallen branches until there was hardly anything left of the body. When the embers cooled and Vera sifted through the ashes, collecting larger pieces of bone which she reburnt again in the range in the kitchen. What was left was spread in the garden around the house. Brian's passport and any other documents relating to him were also burnt. When the body was disposed of fully, Vera, Veronica, Colin and the boys moved to England. There, Veronica would have a little boy. Things were tense once more between the three. Vera and Colin in particular did not get on. Veronica would say later that it was like Vera had replaced Brian with Colin and treated him terribly. Every little thing Colin did was a problem for Vera. Finally, Veronica and Colin decided to move back to Ireland, but first they would visit Colin's family, so were delayed a few days before they arrived in Ireland. But when they got back there, guess who was waiting for them? Vera. She told them she wouldn't be able to cope on her own with the three boys in England, so she followed them home. She was also furious and demanded to know where they had been, that she had been waiting for four days for them to arrive. Veronica, unwilling to try and live with her mother again, found a flat in Castle Blaney in County Monaghan. But it was a dump and Veronica could no way live there with a small baby. Colin, at this stage, was fed up and unwilling to live with or near Vera, so he decided to go back to England to find work. This move would be the end of his and Veronica's marriage. He would move on, meet someone new and never return. This left poor Veronica devastated and with no choice but move back in with her mother in Cool. Vera and Veronica then moved to Navan to live and Veronica would have another son. Six years later, Veronica would move to Liverpool and stayed in a shelter just like her mother had done when she was a child. There she was happier and confided in the staff about what had happened to her father. 
the staff contacted the police and a solicitor and Cherie told the story to them. But nothing was done, so Veronica returned to Ireland, told a friend and he got a solicitor for her there. Gardy visited Veronica and took a statement and they visited the site where Brian was buried in Cool. Vera, in the meantime, was living in Navan and was none the wiser as to what her daughter was doing. Veronica showed Gardy where the attack took place, first near the house, then the ditch near the road, and then back to the house where her father had died. She showed the Gardaí also where the remains were dispersed around the garden. A forensic team were called out and they examined the burial place of Brian. There they would find a jawbone, complete with teeth, and bones from a human arm. Clothing was also found and they took into their possession concrete pillars from the land. A murder inquiry was opened. Vera was arrested for the murder of her husband in November 1993. She was held for two days and eventually admitted to what had happened. She admitted that she hit Brian over the head only once, that it was Colin who had killed Brian. She was then released. Gardy tracked Colin down and went to speak to him in Yorkshire in England about what had happened that night. He told them that it was an accidental death. Even after Veronica had told Gardy about the killing of her father and her mother knowing that it was her that turned her in, they both still maintained a mother-daughter relationship. They even lived together on and off in Navan. When Veronica had her third child, they were all living in the house together. In October 1996, Vera received news that no charges were to be brought against her for the killing of Brian and the inquiry into his death was closed. Vera was elated and Veronica was left confused. As far as the Gardaí were concerned, they had spoken to both Vera and Colin and had statements from both that Brian had been attacked and killed but the DPP felt that the statements weren't enough and because DNA was not a fixture in Ireland at this stage, they could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the bones found belonged to Brian. Over the years, Veronica's life did not get any easier. Her three boys were taken into foster care and she was diagnosed with depression and PTSD. She moved from one place to the next and was never able to settle down. But she did eventually marry again and had two little girls. She was tormented by the fact she had told the authorities what had happened and justice never came for her father. In 2008, the Garda Cole case team decided to look into the case once more. They contacted Veronica and asked for permission to exhume the remains that had been found at the family home. She granted this permission. Veronica returned to Ireland once more and to her mother again. The Garda examined the house and land at Cool. Veronica was interviewed once again while staying with her brother in Galway. She was in Galway because again she had fought with Vera. Veronica would find herself pregnant again and she moved herself and her two girls into a mobile home on the land next to her home place in Cool. Her mother Vera lived in the house, while another caravan was set up at the side of the house where Veronica's eldest son and her brother lived. In November 2008, Vera was brought in for questioning to Mullingar Garda Station and then she was released. In February 2009, Colin was also brought in for questioning and charged with the murder of Brian and remanded in custody. Vera by now was also arrested and charged with Brian's murder. She spent a week in custody before being released on bail. The conditions of her bail was that she was to stay away from Veronica and away from the house in Cool. On the 14th of June 2010, the trial began. Colin and Vera were to be tried together because it was alleged that it was a joint effort in killing Brian. Both pleaded not guilty, but eventually Colin pleaded guilty to manslaughter, which the DPP rejected. Gardy gave evidence of the statements given by Veronica, Vera and Colin, which I've already mentioned. When Veronica had given her evidence on the stand, she was cross-examined over a period of five days by the defence representing Vera and Colin. Veronica said she had been pressured by her domineering mother to say things against her father, but that they had a good relationship and that she loved her father. Neither Vera nor Colin took to the stand in their defence. DNA was vital to bring about charges against Vera and Colin, and now this DNA was available. The forensics could now prove that the bones found in the shallow grave 
when compared to the DNA of the McGrath boys, was indeed Brian McGrath. The court was told that the initial investigation could not proceed as they could not identify the bones as belonging to Brian, even though they had statements admitting to the crime. The cause of death couldn't be certain, as some of the bones were burnt, broken or not recovered. But the blow to the jawbone was significant and had occurred before death, and it was likely the cause of death. The doctor that referred Brian to the psychiatric hospital gave evidence also of how Veronica had backed up the claims of her mother in order to get him committed. His notes said that according to Vera, Brian was aggressive, abusive and paranoid, and he noted bruises on Veronica. But the doctor admitted that he sectioned Brian without ever seeing him or speaking to him or getting to assess him, which I think is disgraceful. Another witness that took to the stand said that she had seen Vera crush tablets and put them into Brian's tea. When poor Brian was out of his head, she dressed him up in women's clothes and called a doctor, stating that her husband was gone mad. Other witnesses also took to the stand, stating that Vera had misconducted herself sexually with other men. One man stated that he'd never be alone with her for fear of Vera putting him in a compromising situation. The trial went on for five weeks in total. The summing up by the judge took four days. He told the jury that the case was a joint enterprise and it didn't matter which blow killed Brian, they were being equally tried for murder. He told the jury that neither a defendant's could be convicted on Veronica's evidence alone and that whatever evidence that was in each defendant's statements could not be used against them either. The jury deliberated over each defendant separately. Colin, after four hours of deliberation, was found guilty of manslaughter. After two days of deliberation, the jury would come back with the verdict of murder for Vera by a majority vote. Vera was sentenced to life in prison and a few months later Colin was sentenced to nine years in prison. An appeal was launched by Vera and the problems the DPP faced were the fact that Vera and Colin were both charged with murder and that it was stated that it was a joint enterprise, both setting out to kill or cause serious injury that led to death. But Vera had been convicted of murder and Colin of manslaughter. The judge on closing at the trial specifically told the jury, quote, this is a joint enterprise or nothing. They also said as the two were tried at the same time with the same jury, evidence that was given was prejudice towards Vera and a benefit to Colin, which was unfair to Vera. The prosecution told the defence at the appeal that both books of evidence was made available to them and they would have read everything that was going to be said and so realised that the evidence could be brought up by other defence teams that would not paint their clients in the best light and so it was then the defence should have asked for separate trials. The three judges disagreed with the prosecution and Vera's conviction was quashed in March of 2013. They directed the prosecution to file murder charges against Vera again in a new trial if they so wished. Vera entered a bail bond and walked free from the courts. The only evidence the DPP had against Vera were her own statements where she played down her involvement and that of Veronica's statements which would need to be further cooperated. In June 2014, Vera, 65, after being charged with assisting Colin in the disposal of her husband's body, was back in the courts to hear her fate. She had pleaded guilty to this and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. As she had already spent two years and seven months of her life sentence, this was credited to her and she walked free from the court. Justice Paul Carney said listening to the evidence of how Brian's body was disposed of in 1987 had made him feel physically ill. He also said because of time already served, she had a, quote, get out of jail free card. A victim impact statement was read out by Brian's son, Edward. He said, quote, my father was a loving, protective, kind man who provided me with a stable home, education and guidance. Edward told the court that his father's name was never allowed to be spoken at home or they were not allowed to have pictures of him on the mantelpiece. Having the initial period of grief extended to 27 years had been unbearable, he said. Brian's other two sons also spoke in court, telling the judge that their father had been a kind, pleasant, hard-working, intelligent man. 
His loss had a profound effect on them. Learning of the barbaric way his life was taken away had left them numb with shock. They all said not having a father figure had left them with no direction in life as children and young men. Veronica would go on to write a book, Witness to Evil. Veronica said she loved her three brothers and her two sons. She described giving up her firstborn son for adoption and then returning the next day for him and naming him after her father, Bernard. Veronica's son, Bernard, 21, would live with her brother, Edward, 35, in a caravan on the site of the Cool home place in 2011, while Veronica lived with her girls there. She would have to take out a protection order against both of them for an undisclosed reason because it being a family court order. They would both break this protection order on the night both had drinking them. They were ordered by the judge that they had to remain sober and were put on probation for 12 months and to stay away from Veronica. Bernard would spend 11 days in custody and the judge described him as vulnerable after reading a psychiatric report on him. Bernard moved to Mullingar on release. Edward received help for his drink problem and his girlfriend stood by him. Veronica, up to 2011, stayed living in the house because, as she said herself, she had nowhere else to go. As of today, I could not find anything on her. Her last interview was with the Irish Independent back in 2011. In 2014, Vera was devastated that her boyfriend of 20 years broke up with her. They had met when he was a teenager and was said to be besotted with her. Michael Gavin, 43, from Navan in County Meath, a devout member of the Legion of Mary, entered their relationship just after her release. As of today, I don't know if Vera is still alive. There's not much else I can say really. The whole family was dysfunctional and by the looks of it, it has passed down through the generations, unfortunately. To me though, it all stems back to Vera and you may have a different opinion on this and that's okay. Brian had his own demons to contend with from being abandoned as a baby with no family to call his own to ending up in Artain Industrial School where I'm sure he suffered greatly and not wanting any priest watching over his sons was telling and he was right especially when what came out about Smith in later years. But what I get from what I know about Brian whatever happened to him in those first 16 years of life did not break him. He joined the army, met a girl that he thought he could build his own little family with. He loved his children and neighbours would say they were always hanging out with him, taking them places and playing with them. To think that everything he went through, everything that had been thrown at him, he still managed to build a life for himself. But it took a woman to break him in the end, that no amount of other abuse could. I tell you, that's saying something. Rest in peace, Brian.